AI is undoubtedly the hottest trend in the world and in the telco industry alike at the moment. But how will it transform networks as we know them? To learn more, I'm delighted to be joined by Anshu Bhatt, Head of SimWorld Solutions at Rakuten Symphony. So Anshu, what is the impact of AI on 5G networks and devices? And what are some of the top use cases? Hi, and it's um, good to be here. Um, so yeah, I think, um, you know, we all are seeing this AI revolution. We have been seeing it in the automobile industry, you know, where we have this five levels of autonomous cars, starting from like manually driven car versus like a level four or a level five autonomous car, which can drive on its own. Similarly, in telco networks too, I think with the developments in the field of AI, we are moving towards level four, level five autonomous networks of the future. And when I say level one to level five autonomous network, what we really mean is that once telco crosses the, the barrier of uh, level three autonomy, um, typically um, the entire process of monitoring, analyzing, decision-making and action orchestration, there will be autonomy in each of these domains too. Um, so yeah, like um, if, if I have to discuss about some of the top use cases, I think in each of these sections, like for example, in monitoring, we, we have been developing and implementing some of the autonomous monitoring use cases, such as anomaly detection, community outlier detection, and things like that. Then when it comes to analytics, um, we, we, we have just recently deployed a use case where you can actually do an audit of your config parameters in inventory completely using an ML model um, around outlier detection instead of relying on the traditional golden configs or baseline config kind of methods to to identify the, the configuration in non-compliances, right? So there are a couple of these use cases. But the part where I'm most excited about is the closed loop automation and autonomous networks. And the difference between the autonomy and automation is the learnability aspect of it. So imagine this scenario. Now you have implemented autonomous monitoring, autonomous analytics, and you do have the, the controllers to execute the actions through your action orchestrator. So you kind of have an idea of um, who is doing what and when. So now we have this AI running under the scenes and trying to observe who is doing what. And in, in some point, it will be able to actually recommend the next best action. And after a bit more confidence, it will actually be able to even take that action. So I think what we are seeing is this movement towards the, the true autonomous networks. And I think AI is at the center of it. And, and that is one, one of the top use cases that I'm really excited about when it comes to network operations using AI. And generative AI has quickly become one of the hottest technology trends. What will be its impact on operator networks? Yeah, generative AI is, is you know, the talk of the town. And, and I think the impact of generative AI in telco is, is, is absolutely no different from all other industries. So I think when it comes to a tele telecom operator, um, there are three areas where I feel generative AI is going to make a difference. Number one is customers. Um, you know, um, I think as a, as a customer experience or a customer support organization, you would want to get, um, you know, your customer's inquiry or query resolved in the minimal time without them reaching out to your call center agent. Because um, if, if, if your agents are like, you know, having a high um, calling, uh, average calling duration or even handling times, then, then it's then your OPEX would, would shoot up. So I think with generative AI, you can actually solve a lot of issues of your customers without them reaching out to your agent and, and save a lot of money and at the same time provide a good customer experience. And then the second aspect is the partners. So I think with the open architectures and open marketplaces that are um, getting enabled with the new open telco architectures, there is this opportunity where a lot of partners or even the smaller startups can contribute towards the telco innovation in the form of R apps, X apps, or other mini apps, you know, based on RIC and NWDAF and concepts like those. So as a partner, having generative AI will definitely help them create and design these apps better and faster. Imagine you are 
let's say an application provider for an R app for a for one of the global telcos tier ones, um, and you you have this UX where you log on to their developer portal and using generative AI, it will help you to to you know sort of um, write the code or the the snippet of the R app based on the operator's framework, and it you just have to give an intent and the application would be ready. So that's an interesting use case, I think, um, with respect to the partner ecosystem. And lastly, um, the telecom network operation teams. And this one is the most excited, um, you know, the use case that I'm most excited about, um, whereby typically today, the NOC engineers of a typical telco even if they have a lot of ideas to automate, there is a limited skill set to be actually able to make those ideas see the light of the day. But with generative AI, the NOC engineers who are typically not the software programmers, they will also be able to code and they will be able to automate too, just based on their intent. So we are actually, in fact, as a matter of fact, working on such a network generative AI um, you know, library which can help our engineers in Rakuten Mobile and other Rakuten Symphony customers to write such automations faster. So I think generative AI is gonna um, improve the innovation and and you know the scale at which the the network teams would be able to automate the day to day problems to a large extent. That's indeed a very good point you're making there. And in your view, what is the importance of edge intelligence and running AI processing closer to the point of consumption? Yeah, I think it's an excellent question. So um, we we cannot just talk about AI and algorithms without talking about the infrastructure and especially things that are happening at the edge, right? So I think there are multiple aspects. Um, for example, from the data storage optimization perspective, a lot of times it might not make sense to bring all of your data um, towards a central data center. So um, a lot of algorithms, um, you know, make sense that if you are running them on the edge. And also I think from the, um, you know, security perspective, um, oftentimes running some of the ML models at the device level is a recommended practice, both in terms of like infra consumption as well as security, whereby you are not bringing any data in the center, but rather processing um, it at an edge and only retrain the model at center in order to you know really make use of the um, the the algorithms by providing the privacy at the same time too. And I think lastly, when it comes to um, you know the edge use cases, as I was mentioning before, that um, it's not just about detecting an anomaly or drawing an ML model inference. It's also important that how fast you are able to do that. So I think. Um, performing a lot of operations at, at the edge might give the telcos the advantage and, um, and you know, um, implement some of the critical X apps and features um, like that in order to close the loop faster and, and optimize the network in, in, in actually real time um, scenarios. With the promise of new AI technologies, what are the biggest challenges for players in the operator ecosystem and how can AI be made more effective? Um, that's, uh, I mean, um, you know, um, a very good question because um, with all these good things comes the the challenges or, you know, opportunities to make things more effective. And at Rakuten Symphony, we have implemented a lot of these ideas into reality in Rakuten Mobile and elsewhere, right? So I think based on our experience, there are two kinds of challenges broadly putting. One is around technology and transformation, uh, which is the easier one of the two. And the second one is around people and processes. So when it comes to technology, it is absolutely very important to make sure that the time um, uh, the data scientists take to deploy an AI model into a production is, is you know, reduced significantly. Today, it takes like months to deploy an AI model into production, and it should be reduced to weeks, if not days. So that is number one. And second is, um, you know, getting all the data at one place. If, if let's say you are a data scientist at a large telco organization, um, in most of the brown fields today, there is no one place where you can find all the data or you can find a metadata dictionary where you, know, you can search through that, okay, what a particular table means and which are the common primary keys across that you can write a model on. So I think this data pipelining and data cleanup 
is significantly large overhead even today. And this needs to be reduced by having a clear data and platform strategy. So that's on the technology side. Now, when it comes to people and processes, I think um, this is the most the more difficult challenge. Um, you know, and, and simply it is because it needs a mindset shift um, and the technology has been evolving at an exponential rate, but the mindset and cultural shift has not yet. What we found is that, you know, um, it is it is absolutely important that the people are aligned with the goal. A lot of times we see that um, there is this, um, you know, inherent fear around that AI will take away our jobs or, or you know, AI is like a nuclear button, it might destroy the network uh, or, you know, it might cause an outage. And even like, how can you trust AI or how, um, because, you know, who, who would you blame if there's a network outage? So there are a lot of these kind of apprehensions and fears that are leading to 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 some like, you know, slower progress than, than we would imagine in, in field of AI and telecom and, and rightly so, but there are some, some ways to even, um, you know, mitigate these challenges and actually have a pragmatic strategy to, to implement AI. And we have done that in, in Rakuten um, ecosystem. So, so happy to talk about, um, you know, some of the steps that how you can mitigate these challenges too. In your opinion, what does success look like and how should it be measured? Yes, I think um, building upon my, my previous point, right, that um, having and having a right AI and data strategy is is an absolute necessity to to um, to, you know, achieve success. And and again, um, you know, you, you cannot really measure um, um, or um, if, if you cannot really measure, then you cannot manage it. So it's as simple as that. So. Um, I think what success looks like is a um, in a pragmatic world where you can actually implement AI ops is, is basically again in people processes and and product side. So, so I think in terms of product, um, you need to implement a common data strategy. You need to get your data in one single pane of view so that you can implement and run AI models on top of it. You have to digitalize um, your data sources. You have to digitalize your automation templates. So AI can actually have a look at, you know, the end-to-end -end network operations in terms of who is doing what and stuff like that. So I think a uh, strong data strategy is an absolute must where you have like your distributor or a centralized data strategy laid out, the right templatization so that people can share or expose their data sets in the right um, format um, so that it's discoverable for the data scientists and engineers. On the people and processes front too, like I was mentioning earlier, um, if you would go to like, let's say a knock office um, and just ask the operation guys that, you know, what are the AI use cases we want to, we have our AI platform ready, let's implement something. They, they might not be able to like, you know, give you ideas at that moment. And a lot of times you might just think that, yeah, there are not many use cases. But the right way of doing it is embedding the AI and automation processes in the network management processes, such as incident management, change management, um, so that you can start creating a backlog of use cases based on your incident uh, debrief lessons learned or based on your repetitive error prone changes that, that you have identified. So I think embedding the automation and AI mindset into the day to day network process is just the right way to, you know, build your backlog and, and um, implement your AI strategy. And of course, um, this all needs to have a very relevant and strong KPIs to measure. For example, um, some of the KPIs that we measure at Rakuten Symphony for, for AI's, uh, AI implementation success is time to fulfillment for a given request, um, you know, from the request time to the actual implementation time using AI or automation. So time to fulfillment is one, uh, one area. Automated deployment is one area. Developer productivity. So basically how many AI models or, um, you know, automation um, templates uh, an engineer is able to ship during a given month, let's say as an example. Um, and then um, implementing an AI model is one thing, but also operationalizing that in production is a totally different ball game. So, you know, how many of your day-to-day -day automations are successful? Are there any anomalies in the implementation durations? Are the automations, you know, forward compatible with the network upgrades and releases? Is the automation happening through a CI/CD pipeline? 
is the end-to-end -end test coverage or security coverage of, of your model implementations in place. So there are a lot of these metrics that the operators might have to measure in order to, you know, um, so really see if they are on the right track uh, in towards the AI implementation journey. So this would be some of the examples around measuring success. And you're making very good points there. And in conclusion, if you could summarize the AI opportunity at hand in three to five words, what would you say? <laughs> um, yes, yeah, so I think um, if I were to summarize it in three to five words, um, one of the um, you know ideas that I'm strongly following um, within our teams is death of dashboards. So a lot of times we see that in the telecom world, even today, a lot of, um, you know, um, uh, OSS or analytics software providers are chasing behind creating better dashboards, bigger dashboards for people. But ideally, in my view, in a true AI world, we should not need any dashboards. Um, although the industry is dependent a lot on dashboarding and stuff like that. When we are in the era of autonomous networks, we would want less dashboards and more closed loop automations. And, and you know, I think that is the right way to manage the networks of the future because they're getting more and more complex and, you know, more and more um, like, you know, large in terms of network size and things like that. But at the same time, you cannot offload the costs to manage them to your customers because um, it is getting more and more competitive. So the only way towards a sustainable telecom future is the, the autonomous networks. And, and that's why this um, phrase, death of dashboards. But anyhow, um, that was a very nice question. These are some great insights there, Anshu. Thank you very much for joining us. Thank you so much, Yanis, for inviting me. Um, it was a pleasure, as usual, being here at Telecom TV. Um, looking forward to see you again. Thank you. Thank you.